Hi, and welcome back to your lecture here in Cultural Anthropology, Anthropology 102. We're on to week eight here in the class, and at this point, we're looking at a series of issues that will round out considerations in cultural anthropology. So this week is an example of one in which we talk about two topics, and they're generally considered to be topics that are specializations within the field of cultural anthropology. We're going to be talking about race this week and ethnicity and also the concept of media anthropology. I've certainly done a lot of work in both of these areas, so in addition to talking through the chapters, I'm going to take you on a journey with some of the supplemental readings. We'll discuss um, research that's done in these areas and we'll even discuss some examples from popular culture as you often see in our media selection that's included in the class. So to get started on the topic of race we'll look at chapter 9. As is typical I really encourage you to look at the specific examples and case studies and objectives that are included in this chapter. So let's jump right now to the readings and we'll have a conversation about what you might look out for in terms of doing this week's work. We'll jump on to chapter 9 here, of course, as you know by now, and we'll just click on the PDF for our readings for week 8. Again, these are the main concepts or learning objectives that you might look at. And I think one of the key things you'll get from this chapter, not unlike our chapter on gender, is the fact that there's often a lot of misperception about what race and ethnicity are, not unlike talking in our conversation about gender, the fact that people often confuse gender for a bi biological entity and not being a cultural, fluid, and contested entity. So when we start with this conversation about defining race as a theme here, we will really get into the nitty-gritty of how anthropologists have challenged assumptions about race that often are not founded on science. And so the author starts off by talking about just the challenge of defining different races, about defining ethnic groups, and the wide range of emotions that could include things like discomfort, fear, defensiveness, anger, and insecurity that's often connected to this topic. Right now in the news, I'm recording this in November of 2021, there was just an election in a number of states across the East Coast, including Virginia, New Jersey, and in some cases, in some of these elections, gubernatorial elections for governor, some of the Democrats lost. And one of the conversations that's been happening on the morning after the election here following the Tuesday election day is the fact that there was kind of this fueling of racial tension on the part of the GOP, on the part of the Republican Party, and the media outlets like Fox News and others that really started to fuel this fire about what they call critical race theory, or CRT. I'm not going to get into it, but I encourage you to actually Google this because it's been a national obsession, if you will, and where I live very close here to Lake Tahoe area in Douglas County, there was a school board meeting that happened where... Um, uh, pr predominantly white people came in and complained about curriculum and what was being taught in Douglas High School and other schools in the district. And this was actually the lead story on CNN a few days after it happened. And there was a really good interview with a number of students and a few teachers who were actually concerned that these people coming to speak at these public events had no idea what they were talking about and said some very hurtful and racist things in their comments at this open school board meeting talking about critical race theory. So this focus on emotions, I think, is a really good place to begin. If you take our SOC 107 class, the Sociology of Race and Ethnic Relations, you'll get into this issue in much more depth. In anthropology, though, it's really important to begin with emotions and also this notion of social constructs very often that people don't understand. A lot of the laws that we saw in the United States that relate to um, interracial marriage or relate to notions of descent and blood are not based on anything scientific, are not based on anything factual, but are really examples of how emotions get taken and put into public policy. And in some cases, white supremacy, hatred, um, really terrible feelings that people have, ethnocentric feelings that they have about other groups of people, those get applied to public debates like we see with CRT, across the United States related to this last election cycle, and then unfortunately become public policy that affects the lives of people being unable to do everyday things that most of us who aren't persons of color maybe get to do without being hassled in our society. For example, if you're not uh, tailed by the police, 
if you don't get pulled over because of your skin color, you have more privilege than someone who does get pulled over for their skin color or their appearance. It's interesting, the author talking about this idea that sometimes physical appearance does become the focus for people, asking questions like, what are you or what's your race? And often uh, people of color, people from heritage backgrounds that maybe could appear on the surface in terms of skin color to be non-white, um, those individuals often are asked questions that those of us who are white are not asked. And um, it's very interesting to think about these subjective determinations, as the author says, that vary wildly from person to person and situation to situation. And they give some additional examples here. And I think these personal tales that you hear to start off the chapter are very important because they really give you a sense of how difference, social difference, racial, ethnic difference happens in society at an everyday level, as we talk about in anthropology, in everyday perspectives. It's not just something that's theoretical and that floats out there. It actually happens. It's manifested in our lives. It's manifested in our social relationships, in our media, as we'll talk about with chapter 16, and in our everyday denials of opportunity or ability to have opportunity and to be successful and not be harassed just because of how we look or what our perceived background happens to be. As the author says, throughout my life, my physical appearance has provided me with countless unique and memorable experiences that have emphasized the significance of race and ethnicity as socially constructed concepts in America and other societies. My fascination with this subject is therefore both personal and professional. A lifetime of questions and assumptions from others regarding my racial and ethnic background have cultivated my interest in these topics. I would say this to you, I would say any of you, whatever your ethnic or racial background is, however you identify, the same applies to gender, to social class, sexual orientation, to really both be proud of your identity and to really critically engage and question it. Keep in mind that we have something called the reflexive perspective in anthropology and in the social sciences. Whenever you think about a situation, including these situations we're talking about here through everyday life experiences, you should definitely see how you relate to that issue. The one thing I wanna to say too is, we shouldn't um, engage in what we often call these microaggressions, where we sometimes call on people who represent a particular group. For example, if it's a gender class, and we call on people who are not straight, or we call on um, uh, transgender people, or we call only on women, the suggestion there is that we're asking people to identify with their group or their background, their demographic um, upbringing, their heritage, whatever we want to call it, which is certainly fine, but then we're assuming that they can, quote, speak for their people. Likewise, I really encourage you, if you come from a dominant group as I do in society, if you're a white male, if you're straight, if you're cis, whatever your dominant position happens to be, don't assume that if we're critiquing that in this class, talking about structures and macro level, big picture assumptions, that you are necessarily implicated. You can actually be a warrior and someone who fights for the rights of LGBTQ plus people, for um, persons of color, for people who are in minority positions and who are lack agency and are denied power in our society because of things like structural racism. Structural racism talks about the structures embedded in our society that cause inequality to persist generation after generation. When we talk about intergenerational mobility and intergenerational poverty that we often see in inner city areas in the US, we're talking about this very issue. Things embedded in society that prevent people born into certain social positions from moving up and having upward mobility. So very important to um, think about these issues. Again, I think defensiveness is negative in a class like this, in any social science class. If you say, well, I'm upset because we're talking about gender issues and we're talking about homophobia and I happen to be a straight white male and um, I'm really upset, I feel defensive about this. Don't feel defensive. Put on your anthropologist hat and look very critically at what we call your own positionality, your position in life, take a reflexive approach to your position in life, and don't be defensive if you come from a dominant group or a less dominant group, whatever. So the question here is anthropology, the science of race. And when we get into the science of race, one of the key things that the author mentions is that it's a discredited concept in human biology. So if you look at a lot of studies of race in society, um, and I really encourage you to look at the race are we so different website that they refer to here. It's one of the best media 
forums that you can look at this week. This was a touring exhibit. Um, over the years, you know, it's uh, impacted a lot of people. But when you click on the um, physical anthropology, say, of race, you start to realize that some of our assumptions that somehow if you look at genetic difference as opposed to within so-called racial groups, African, European, and Asian, the assumption of someone who believes in this discredited notion of race would say, well, there's going to be more genetic variation without or outside of the races as opposed to within. It's actually the reverse. So there's more genetic variation within the so-called races than without or outside of them. So it's one of many examples of how we really don't read the science. We assume that there's science out there that's going to support a lot of this. We can look at variation in human skin color. And this is one area where I think it, it's quite interesting to have a conversation about skin color. I'm actually looking here to see um, they don't have the chart I'm looking for, but if you do, if you diagram a chart, okay, I'll actually bring out my handy diagram here since I want to explain this to you. But what I'm trying to get you to look at here is specifically this idea of the difference between discrete and continuous variables as we discuss them in the social sciences. So a discrete variable means that something falls within one, two, three, four or more uh, distinctive categories. So the variable might be our assumption about race and we say there are white people, there are Asian people, there are black or African American people. We won't get into terminology and there's a whole conversation out there about the term say for referring to people from Latin American or Spanish descent. Do we refer to people as Chicana, Chicanos, um, Latinx, uh, Hispanic? You know, There's a whole conversation just about naming of different ethnic groups. So a discrete variable assumes that people fall into the discrete categories. A continuous variable is in fact looking at a continuum. A continuum is a range between different points related to the scale or the context of whatever that we're studying. So here is where we'll bring in our discussion of skin color. So we could say there is variation of human skin color. Um, I could look at my skin color, someone else who could be darker from me, we could say we have different um, variation or different markers genetically in terms of skin color. So we could have on one end light skin and on the other end dark skin. And let's say we could kind of, um, in a classroom or in a group, kind of line people up and assign just based on the variable of skin color, the lightness or darkness. And physical anthropologists or others could actually do what we call luminosity studies. I could take a bright light, shine it on my skin, shine on your skin, and then we can do a measurement to see how much light is reflected off of our skin. And so we could indeed scientifically study the, um, the uh, fact of what color our skin is in terms of it being dark or light and maybe place it on a scale and we can assign numbers to that and then say, okay, this is where everyone falls. Here's the problem with that. We then take certain categories which are continuous and not discrete variable and we say at this point, we're gonna break off everybody who is this level of dark skin. This is another category and this is a third. And then we can label each of these, right? Give them racial identification names or something like that. Well, here's the error we've done. We've taken a variable that is continuous and cannot be measured in terms of actual categories. We are the ones attaching significance, cutting off a point. If the difference here in a number is, let's say, 7 and 7.5, um, right, and then we break break it off here and say you fall into that category. That is the fundamental flaw with looking at skin color. It's a continuous variable, and we are the ones lumping it into these discrete categories. I love using this example that always stuck with me from my physical anthropology classes back in the day because people make this mistake. And again, they say, well, you know, I have a scientific basis that I'm making this decision on in terms of race. You actually don't. And the more you study this, the more you engage with the research, the more you engage with research from anthropology, molecular biology. There's a great book that I use in my classes by William Graves, molecular biologist from Arizona State University. And in fact, you start to look at the science and it's all fundamentally flawed, the presumed science. 
even looking back at racial categories, you see incredible variation of some scientists who would identify even back 150, 200 years ago, 53 different races versus maybe three races. So that amount of variation that scientists even work with in terms of saying the number of races on the planet really shows you the flaw in attempting to take something that is cultural, subjective, contested, created and constructed, and turn it into something that appears to be factual, that appears to be categorical, that appears to fit in discrete categories. It's not unlike the flaw in gender. When someone says something like, you're a man or a woman, right? And says there's two categories for gender. It's ridiculous. Again, gender is a continuous variable and all of us display masculine and feminine characteristics. We then attach significance to certain characteristics and say, if you're a man, you're tough, you wear a cowboy hat, you're aggressive, whatever, you're straight, whatever assumptions we have. Flawed assumptions that are based on essentialism or essences that we think characterize how someone is. Unfortunately, the same thing happens with race. So we say the essence of being white is this, the essence of being black is this. And then that leads us into all these terrible directions in terms of social policy. So just to go back to the chapter there, again, I really encourage you to jump onto that website, the AAA race website. It's one of the best teaching tools I've used in, in many years. And I just hope you really look at this. As it says here, it's very important to challenge the true nature of human biological and cultural variation and challenge common misperceptions that we have about race. Now, also, there's um, a big idea here that th often these concepts are reified or given life, if you will, in literature, the media, and culture. It's the process by which an inaccurate concept or idea is heavily promoted and circulated among people. It seems to take on the life of its own. So this might happen in video games. It might happen in feature movies. Um, the old show Cops that was popular in American popular culture for years, I don't know if it's still in the air, would always show persons of color, black people, maybe Latinx people, as criminals. And the cops often would be white. And so this creates this reification, this idea in our heads, and these could be ideas shared by non-white people or white people that think that persons of color commit crimes and the good guys are police officers and they also happen to be white. Um, and so this is a real problem when we talk about this long history of reification. It certainly continues in popular culture and it's happened, as they say here, in old theories of science. You'll talk about in some of your other anthropology classes you might take about how some of the earliest anthropologists, folks like Morgan and Maine and Tyler, who literally were the founders of our discipline, had incredibly racialist, if not racist, if not white supremacist attitudes about human cultures. They tend to identify white Americans and white Europeans, light-skinned Americans, light-skinned Europeans as being more civilized and individuals from across the world, whether it was Native American society, South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, Australia, who were darker skinned, were seen as inferior, were seen as less sophisticated. And uh, there was one framework that was created called the ethnical periods where these anthropologists tried to justify these racialist assumptions. So it's also embedded in scientific and anthropological history. It's really good in this page to get into the physical anthropology, the evidence. Um, in a lot of my physical anthro classes, both as undergrad and graduate student, we really delved into the problematic biology that's behind race. Now, we also know that there are correlations with race, and some of this you can look at, by the way, with Ancestry or 23andMe. Really encourage you, if you're into genealogy and studying DNA, to get into some of this, because it's pretty interesting and cool to log into some of those sites and to see that you might be more inclined to have issues with high blood pressure. You might have vitamin D deficiency, and some of this could correlate with your genetic makeup. But again, that is okay, I think, to talk about that and to consider that because we're not making social policies based on that. Once we attach significance, once we do that operation that I talked about here, saying you are lumped into one or the other category, and then we're going to deny you social rights, we're going to deny you opportunities for a job, for education, as we see happening in many cultures and, and nations across the world, 
that's where the real problem comes into it. So check out the physical anthropological evidence. I think you'll find it very interesting when you look at, say, issues of lactose intolerance, vitamin D deficiency, and so forth. Again, here, the idea of biological race emphasizes differences real and perceived between groups and ignores or overlooks differences within groups. So that study we looked at from the AAA website on race is a great example of this. Again, when we talk about race in anthropology, we say there is biological and cultural association with race, but very often we get things mixed up and then we deny opportunities for people because we think that somehow our assumptions are racist or racialist or race-based assumptions are based on facts, are based on science. Now, Franz Boas is a very important figure in American anthropology. He was actually censored by the AAA, and years later they removed that censor. Uh, Boas was very much challenging the um, ethnical periods and the unilineal cultural evolutionists. He's not just the father of American anthropology, but he was a really a pioneer and someone who tried to combat racism and anti-Semitism. And definitely as a Jew, he was subject to anti-Semitism as he tried to really deal with uh, these issues. And a lot of people were trying to measure, say, the cranium and trying to make some correlations about racial purity and said, you know, you can measure these um, craniums and make an assumption about intelligence based on this. The late biologist Stephen Jay Gould had a very important book called The Mismeasure of Man in which he takes on this very assumption. As they say here, Boaz asserted that the notion of racial purity was utter nonsense. As present-day anthropologist Jonathan Marx has said, you may group humans into a small number of races if you want to, but you're denied biology as a support for that. Again, going back to skin color, we're doing something very subjective and arbitrary, nothing scientific about this when we know that skin color goes as a continuous variable from dark to light. We are the ones that attach significance at the breakoff points when we're measuring luminosity, the light reflected off of our skin. So race, we say, is a social concept. And so as a social concept, we have some possibilities to deconstruct the ideologies, the racialism, the white supremacy in our societies. We have opportunities to dismantle wrong-headed social policy that's racist and that holds people back. And so this is where we start looking at the social construction of race and indeed say that um, race, if we're going to say isn't real, one of the reasons we're saying that maybe is we're really concerned about the social policies that continue to define and deny people opportunities in the United States and in many other cultures uh, around the world and nations around the world. We can talk about the issue of racial formation and talk about how whiteness is constructed in the United States. You know, very often we see negative energy directed towards, in this example, Irish Catholics. So, you know, you could even have someone who looks racially very white, but depending on the context and situation, is denied opportunities. You think about the whole history related to Catholics and Protestants in Ireland and all the wars and, and uh, uh, violence that's happened over the years. You know, you see variations of these uh, principles of racism and discrimination and stereotyping happening everywhere around the world. In some places, you could have people that look very closely to one another. There could be tribal distinctions, as we saw with genocide in Rwanda, uh, profiled in Hotel Rwanda and other films and documentaries over the years. So whiteness is very interesting in the sense that we can start to deconstruct and dismantle, again, some of these notions and attitudes that we may hold um, against people that maybe look very similar to us. So very important to kind of consider whiteness. There's another side of whiteness that I think is, is pretty interesting because sometimes when we ask people who might be a European ethnic group, um, a white person, European American person in the U.S., and we say, talk about your background, they, they might say something like, well, I don't really have heritage. I'm not like you. I don't have a, an ethnic background. And so sometimes Americans who are white ethnic Americans are sometimes taught that they don't have to um, talk about their identity, they don't have to be proud of it, or they don't even have to consider it. So that might be that sense of privilege that some people might have, depending on the situation, because there are other social factors and variables besides race, like social class, biological sex, gender, sexual orientation, disability, etc. That can also be brought to bear on these issues. By the way, we call that concept, or that focus, looking at how um, these categories intersect one another, 
We call that intersectionality. It's a very important concept that you'll consider in the social science, sciences, women's studies, cultural studies, ethnic studies, if you go on in any of these fields, American studies as well. So it's kind of interesting sometimes that white Americans maybe are encouraged not to think about their ethnic identity. Um, shows like um, Henry Louis Gates, his show on um, genetics and ancestry, I think is another example of how you can open up um, a history, a story, if you will, a narrative about your own ethnic background. I encourage you to do the same with uh, 23andMe and um, those other great websites out there that allow you to do some genetic testing and get a very clear portrait of your ancestry. Now, the article by Peggy McIntosh, White Privilege and, and Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, I re really encourage you to look at. This is um, an article we use in a lot of training out there for community events and also for academic events. And we'll come back to that in a second when we talk about our extra readings. Now, I'm not going to go through this in depth, but I encourage you to look at this case study, Race in Three Nations, the U.S., Brazil, and Japan. It's very important to have these case studies because they really give us an understanding of how race doesn't just differ significantly within a culture or society. The same thing can be said throughout the world and in specific um, societies and cultures. So very important case study to look at. So look at that one in depth if you get the chance. We can talk about race and ethnic groups and generally ethnic groups talk about shared identity based on cultural characteristics, maybe a shared ancestry believed to give its members a unique sense of peoplehood or heritage. We sometimes connect ethnicity to the concept of uh, folkways. The idea that if you're Polish like I am or Slovak, maybe certain foods that you ate or your grandparents and relatives spoke certain languages um, as you grew up. It starts to then connect to your kind of ethnic identity, could be your pop culture, could be your choice in food and drink and dance, how you dress, how you talk in terms of your language and so forth. So ethnicity is a really significant concept. And I think most people, when they understand ethnicity, realize a lot of it is constructed. And it's something that often is very symbolic. And then uh, talking about symbolic identity is kind of this example I mentioned with white ethnic Americans. You might have limited or occasional displays of ethnic pride and identity that are primarily expressive, say for public display, rather than being instrumental as a major component of their daily lives. So if on St. Patty's Day you wear a kiss me, kiss me, I'm Irish button or something like that, that might be seen as more symbolic and not inherent to your everyday identity. Again, if you're not experiencing discrimination based on your ethnic or racial identities, then that's a big difference maybe in terms of how identity and ethnicity is played out symbolically or more instrumentally. So a lot of really good discussion here, um, talking about ethnic groups, talking about ethnogenesis, the emergence of a new distinct identity that responds in terms of changing social characteristics, a lot of examples of that. Now, a melting pot or salad bowl, I think one of the questions that comes up in both sociology and anthropology is, when someone emigrates and becomes part of a new culture, are they asked to give up their identity? Um, years ago, I was at a school board meeting I'll just say in this general area, I won't say where it was. And I was really shocked because I heard um, some white parents or teachers at this meeting talking about how the Latinx kids and their parents, uh, quote, need to speak English only and, and need to assimilate to white culture. Um, I found it shocking. It was a horribly racist and offensive thing for these people to say. And that's an example of how sometimes people will make assumptions and say, well, the dominant culture is this, and so therefore, or the dominant ethnic group is this, so therefore, all of us should speak one language. All of us should be the same way. And um, it's really shocking because, again, anthropology is about celebrating diversity through cultural relativism and not through ethnocentrism, where you take too much pride in your own culture that you identify it with it too much and you attack other groups because they're different from you. So multiculturalism is this notion of trying to really bring people together and not say that everybody has to strip out their cultural identity such that they become the same. And that's that's a very unfortunate situation that is certainly not taking into account these principles of relativism we've talked about in anthropology. In terms of race and sports, there's a ton of things that have happened over the years. The NBA, the NFL, talking about um, 
you know, anthems, Colin Kaepernick, there's a new series in 2021 that just came out about Colin Kaepernick. A lot of the protests over the shootings of um, innocent people that that led to the uh, creation of um, BLM to Black Lives Matter. Um, really important in identifying how a lot of these issues have um, standing or can be given exemplification or illustration in terms of our popular culture. So very important to look at at these issues. We'll talk about this more with our media selections for this week as well. There's a lot of good discussion of sports and um, assumptions say about which ethnic groups or racial groups are assumed to be athletes and which aren't and so forth. So um, it's an issue that always comes up if you watch any NFL football, as I do, a lot of conversation about the Rooney rules and the idea that um, a lot of uh, coaches of color, unfortunately, are not hired um, or considered even for some of the top positions, even though there is the so-called rule that exists in the NFL. So a really good chapter. I think this is going to be a week that you're going to be engaged, whether it's the racial topics or the media topics. Now to go to the additional readings and media that you can check out, let's click on that and just do a quick perusal of it because I think you'll find that this is going to supplement some of the things in the chapter. So what I recommend is click on the additional reading and this is where you're going to get a lot of great insights from the AAA. This is the statement on race and the statement goes along with the project on race. It's basically saying a series of principles that um, race should not be as should not be seen as a significant scientific principle. It should not be used in such a way that it divides people or prevents people from achieving opportunities in society. You can look at this really good selection of articles. I encourage you to look from Open Anthropology on race, racism, and protesting anthropology. And here's the great Peggy McIntosh piece, and she goes through so many examples of how often people are taught to see racism only as individual acts of meanness and not as the invisible systems that confer dominance on particular groups and deny particular groups opportunities based on racial assumptions. And so she goes through a series of examples saying, you know, I'm pretty sure that I can turn on the television and see people of my race widely represented. So that's, you know, interesting to think about because I think a lot of people, if if you're not from a group that has been denied opportunities in society and you're not on an everyday basis being confronted with your racial identity because you're always being tailed in a store because someone thinks because of your skin color that you're going to steal something, then again, you have this invisible knapsack. It's something that's there. It protects you from the forces of social oppression, from racism, from stereotyping, from discrimination, from being tailed in a store, from being pulled over, driving while black, as we call it. And it's invisible because you're not taught, again, to see it as existing and if you do see it, it always comes back to the idea of individual acts of meanness and not systemic dominance. And this is why we call it, talk about systemic racism and we don't just focus on individual acts of cruelty that as bad as they are, do not necessarily mean that um, we're fully understanding the cultural significance of how racism operates in society. So a lot of good opportunities there to look at this work. The rest of this will cover in the media anthropology segment coming up in the second part of this lecture. And I encourage you to watch some of these videos. If some of these are interesting, you can include a conversation about what you learn in one of these videos in a discussion post that's connected to one of these areas. So everything on racism and anthropology, social anthropologist studying race. You can look at a talk that I gave years ago at the college on diversity, equity, and access, talking about the work of Peggy McIntosh and others, and really the reaction against the work of Peggy McIntosh that we noted in a lot of college campuses when students were being asked to read this article. Um, certain white people, as I talked about earlier, got defensive and said, you're saying I'm a bad person because you're asking me to look reflexively at my race. It's like, no, we're not saying that you're a bad person. You have the choice to decide whether you're going to be a good or a bad person, depending on how critical you want to be about your privilege as it exists in your own social circumstances. We can also look at the biology of race. Um, this lecture, this is from the AAA. It goes over the AAA website, which you'll find here. The story of race also is a good historical look from the AAA that connects to the project. 
And then you may have heard of the work of Rachel Doazel, who um, pretended, if you will, she um, claims to be transracial. She was the chairman, I believe it was the Spokane, Washington NAACP, and was discovered that she's a white woman and grew up as a white woman in fairly privileged circumstances, but began to identify as African American and indeed has a child through a former marriage or relationship with an African American man. So she certainly has um, a child of color. But um, people got really concerned about how Doazel sort of appropriated black culture and tried to talk in a certain way, again, focusing on essences and stereotypes of how she perceives certain people to talk, and then dyeing her um, hair, um, you know, dreadlocks. Um, certainly those are choices people can make about their appearance, but the concern was sort of how she began to appropriate black culture for her own uh, performance as a white woman. So very interesting if you want to look at that case study and comment on it. And then I very much encourage you to look at Danny Glover, his very famous uh, work is Childish Gambino, which is his stage name. This is America. So what I would like you to do is to go through this video, watch it. It's a short video. It has something close to a billion views, which is crazy. And just look at all the racial allegories and historical constructs of race that are portrayed in this video. Um, I also encourage you to go online if you watch it and you're still like, well, I wonder what he's referring to here. Look at all the allegories that people have um, identified in the This Is America video. It's um, an important video. I think it's one of the most powerful videos from the music world, from the video music world on race that I've seen in many, many years. And by the way, that will be a great segment this week for us to move from the focus on race into the next issue, which is the focus on media anthropology. So to get started with our focus on media anthropology, you're going to jump a little bit here, the chapters to chapter 16. As you did in chapter nine, please be very familiar with the learning objectives as you understand them and as they connect to this topic that we'll look at here, the second topic for the week, focused on media anthropology. So let's jump into chapter 16 here and get an understanding more about what we mean by media anthropology. And I would offer that this is sometimes not traditionally a topic that gets covered in anthropology. In general, you might say that there's a bit of a uh, taboo against covering media and pop culture in anthropology. It's seen maybe as something more appropriate to study in sociology. As you'll see from my work, though, I really challenge us to accept the idea that it is normal to cover the media, consumer culture, and popular culture in our studies in cultural anthropology. We can talk about the media as a general word that's used to describe any set of technologies that connect people at one time to shared content. So everything that we might imagine under the sun is included in media. So broadcast radio, television, digital media, the internet, streaming media, and so forth. And one thing that anthropologists consider is how particular groups or communities actually will take and adapt to media and create what we call a media practice, which could be called the habits or behaviors of people who produce the audiences who interact with media and everyone in between. So a lot of uh, anthropological studies are out there that have looked at media in so many different contexts. Everything from looking at watching TV programs, it could be soap operas or other TV shows that talk about collective or cultural identity, to Tom Bellstorff's book, Coming of Age and Second Life, looking at how communities might be built in virtual reality situations like Second Life. With the recent announcements in 2021 of Facebook changing its name to Meta and the idea of creating the Metaverse, which would be this augmented reality area, if you will, or world in which we'll eventually possibly interact, I think is very interesting because it suggests that these might be new practices or cultural terrains or social terrains for anthropologists to study. And it's also po possibly an opportunity for us to think more critically about the overuse of media in our lives. As they say here, though, it's important to remember that media practices are not universal. We always are talking about how media gets adapted in local cultural contexts. Now, I encourage you to look at Powdermaker's book called Hollywood, The Dream Factory, talking specifically about how Hollywood creates certain values and how certain understandings that we have of the world often come through this world of Hollywood and film. I have actually included the entire book for you to take a look at this week 
in our additional readings so we can look at that later. So it's a very important book to look at. One of the interesting things here that I might identify with my earlier point about why anthropologists have sometimes shunned the study of media, popular consumer culture, and anthropology is maybe this notion here, the idea that we might be seen less as scientists and more as journalists. It might also be seen as less serious in terms of being scholarly work. So I think that's definitely one side of looking at why anthropologists have been maybe not so excited about studying media and why some of us, myself included, have focused on the media in some important senses in our own work. Now, I think one interesting question here is, why do anthropologists want to study the media and media practices? And so you can think about the different ways in which anthropologists have studied media. First, we often choose a category or type of media, mobile telephone, radio, television, the internet, and others. If you look at the work of Daniel Miller, an anthropologist from the UK, he's done a lot of work on social media, including Facebook. In my own work, I've focused on film remakes, as I'll talk about in just a little bit. Some anthropologists might study particular technology like mobile phones, which play music, allow for phone calls and support gaming communities, and explore how that single technology contributes to different types of media practices. So in my own work, for example, I've also looked at video games and specifically communities of video gamers and some of the messages, including cultural messages, we note inside of the world of video games and their communities. So second, Media anthropologists sometimes locate their ethnographic studies within a particular community. The way that media anthropologists define community does vary. Some may choose to study a virtual community like Tom Belsdorf did in his study of Second Life. Others may choose to study how a geographical community, like a town or region, uses, adapts, or transforms under the influence of a certain kind of media or technology. Now, one important idea that we can talk about in terms of media is the notion of meaning. Meaning refers to the ideas or values that accompany the exchange of information in these different forms that we're talking about. And I really encourage you as you're studying media this week and media anthropology to look at some of the meanings of the media itself and then the narratives within media. More and more as we're studying what we call transmedia, we're considering the idea that certain narratives or meanings are shared across one platform to another. And transmedia is exemplified, say, in the world of video games and feature films. Uh, could be Harry Potter, could be Marvel action heroes and so forth, and how different versions of the same story are told in different media platforms. So transmedia is an important topic to talk about this week as well. Now, as we've talked about, just like with understanding media, its non-universal nature, there isn't a universal way of consuming media, and we always say media consumption is bound to culture. As well, media anthropologists tend to focus on how producers and audiences share or contest different types of meaning. One of the more curious things, recalling maybe that film I talked about some time back called Trouble and Cricket, where people in the Trouble and Islands adapted a non-indigenous sport, the game of cricket, brought from the British colonial empire into their culture, the same thing can be said of media forms and how people use media forms and adapt it in various ways. One example of that actually comes up in this uh, edited collection I co-edited with philosopher John Marmich from College of Marin. This is called Fear, Cultural Anxiety, and Transformation, Horror, Science Fiction, and Fantasy Films Remade. So we are very specifically interested in looking at how horror sci-fi and fantasy films are remade say from one cultural context into another it makes me think of some of our contributors here daniel herbert who was very interested in how transnational dislocation occurs in films like insomnia and juan or the grudge so these are films that maybe get made in one cultural context in Scandinavia, and then a remake is made where the characters, languages, the scenarios change, but it's remade in the US. The same thing with Juan and the Grudge. It's originally made in Japan, and then it's um, given an American version that still has some of the Japanese, say, individuals involved in the original film, like the director, but changes for the context. So for me, one of the more interesting things looking at with film remakes is how the film is remade and then how it's adapted to a new cultural context. In some ways, it happens in a controversial sense because people are concerned that the original meanings of the film 
that preceded this remake are somehow lost. So for me, it's an encouragement to continue to study how the meanings of media change as we move through particular forms, in this case, the form of the film remake. We can also look at the anthropology of mediation, which is a focus on the ways that um, images, speech, people, and things become socially significant or meaningful as they're communicated. So you could begin to see that a lot of our everyday identity and meaning is often achieved through these forms that we interact with, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's on social media, whether it's through watching films or shows on TV that in my particular case are more interesting because of their context of remaking that are uh, part and parcel of understanding contemporary media forms. A lot of other great case studies you can look at here. So I encourage you to look through those case studies and think of your own this week. If something sparks your interest, I encourage you to talk about that in our discussions focused on media anthropology. There's a great discussion of what makes media possible. And I think one of the big issues there are these contexts of things like infrastructure, the apparatuses that bring networks of technology into in existence, and those forms that include values, beliefs, communities, states, or societies that make the imagining of a particular type of network possible. Right at this moment, as we're talking about Facebook, we're talking about the metaverse, we really have to ask some serious questions about how media is having a negative impact on our cultures and other cultures around the world. There was a recent revelation in 2021, in the fall, a whistleblower, not like unlike Edward Snowden, came forward and released tens of thousands of pages of secret Facebook documents. What it indicated really parallels what happened with the tobacco industries back in the 70s where they admitted openly, but it was hidden in documents, that they knew that nicotine was addictive. They knew that they were marketing their cigarettes and nicotine addiction to kids as young as 13 or 14. Once this came out and it became a film called The Insider with um, a lot of famous actors, in, including Al Pacino, people really began to understand that companies often could create or use forms of culture in, in today's case, talking about media and technology and Facebook in ways that have a negative impact on us. And even if they know that's the case, they may do nothing about it. The Facebook revelation in 2021 is particularly damning because what was revealed is that Facebook knows that it connected and was related to the January terrorist attacks, the insurrection on the Capitol that resulted in deaths of multiple people, including police officers, including by suicide after the fact. And also that civil wars and unrest among cultures, um, potentially leading even to genocide or mass violence, was also connected to false information posted on social media. In the age of COVID-19, we realize that anti-vaxxer, false anti-science information, fraudulent treatments for horses are being promoted on conspiracy sites and then making their way into social media. If Facebook does nothing about this, and we know, going back to these earlier points, that we create meaning, we create personal identity, we rely on social media for everyday information, including information that impacts our physical or mental health, how do we feel about that? Should these companies have this much power in a consumer society such that they're using, as they talk about this infrastructure, to connect us all and maybe connect us as the Facebook revelation case proves in some incredibly dangerous ways. So it's something for us to definitely think about. There's a really good case study here of a practicing anthropologist talking about her own work. So I encourage you to look this over. I'll also talk about my work as well. You're welcome to ask any questions about it. We can also talk about participatory media and how activism plays a role in the discussion of media within anthropology. Terry Turner is an example of an anthropologist who used his own role to work the, with the Kaipo in Brazil and to try to use video as a way of collecting indigenous knowledge about ceremonies, about um, various aspects that are the mythology. So trying to create empowerment through media forms. And if you take classes in ethnomusicology or take my anthropology of music and sound class, we talk about the issue of decolonizing archives. These could be video or sound archives in which we try to give back to the local communities because we sometimes understand 
that anthropologists and others have collected video and audio records of their informants, of their cultural groups, and then that is sort of held in their own archives, and thus the power implications in terms of that media becomes a, a really key issue to talk about. So I think one of the continuing questions for us is not just how we as anthropologists study media in our own context, and our own work, but how we can use it in some activist senses to raise awareness about issues or to repatriate or give back to local communities and indigenous cultures their own uses of media that they should be taking control of, and we shouldn't see this as something that the anthropologist controls in terms of that information. Here's another really good example of anthropologists studying hip-hop artists in Peru, so I definitely um, encourage you to look that over. We can see other examples here of how um, indigenous groups around the world, this is Microsoft's Worldwide Telescope as an example, a very interesting project. And then this project, which you can click on, the Rich Interactive Narrative Technology. And I've seen more and more, um, even prior to COVID, but during COVID, where for purposes of tourism or cultural awareness, indigenous groups around the world use their own media, again, try to reclaim it in terms of this notion of indigenous knowledge, and then try to present themselves to the world using their own voices. That, to me, is a particularly powerful side of media. I think going back to the LA riots and Rodney King and later examples happening in the news where because all of us have cell phones that we carry with us in our everyday lives, we can be witnesses and that witnessing allows the recording of often very horrific crimes that are committed, but nonetheless can that media can be used, that evidence can be used to prosecute people who have committed crimes against, say, African Americans in the United States and other places. There's also a discussion here about if you're using media and you're um, potentially recording people, how do you anonymize these participatory media subjects? And it's a very important thing, as we talked about in the past, really important for us to protect our informants. And you can imagine that if you're taking recordings of people, you would want to make sure you protect the recordings, particularly if you don't want evidence getting out to the world if someone says something negative and maybe that's used against them. So it's a continued example of how we need to protect our informants in our research studies, but then we need to come up with new ways of doing that because we understand that having a video recording of someone is a lot different than sitting down and interviewing them, maybe not publishing your audio recordings, but transcribing things. Having video is, is very powerful because you get the sense of not just witnessing, but a sense of almost like telepresence just like here, watching the video and coming into closer contact with the person who's doing the talking. So a lot of really rich and important stuff to look in our media chapter this week. I hope that will, will spark some great conversations among our class and our discussions. Now let's look at the additional reading as well that you can check out. So scroll past the race information and the race readings. Look at um, uh, Powder Makers Hollywood, The Dream Factory again, referenced in our book, and it would be great for you to look at. I have a chapter, two chapters actually, the introduction and also the um, chapter on horror and video game remakes with um, zombie films that I look at and zombie video games from the book on um, horror sci-fi fantasy film remakes. So check out both of those. I include the chapters for you just to get a sense of my analysis that I'm, I'm approaching the work with. A second piece was this contribution to a book called Joystick Soldiers, which looked at the interplay between video games and the military. So you're welcome to look at my chapter here called Behind the Barrel, which um, includes some ethnographic um, interviews with some gaming communities talking to people about their perceptions about weapons and particular type of types of guns that they note in the world of video games. So check that out as well. And then my other work really focuses on studying immersion and theme spaces. So these could be like a theme casino like the Paris Las Vegas. And I've also written for professional audiences, um, individuals in the design industry who are interested in maybe bringing in cultural design elements into their own spaces. So this is talking about the history of immersion that could be understood in designing uh, themed and immersive spaces. So that's kind of really written for more of a practical audience of people actually working in the industries that I also happen to be studying. And then in addition to that work, kind of along the same lines, I've written this practical book called The Immersive Worlds Handbook, which is really designed for individuals who want to create a theme space. It includes 
quite a few interviews with people in the design world, um, including, say, individuals who design many of the Las Vegas strip casinos that you see if you if you visit Las Vegas. So um, I can point you to more of that work as well. And then I've written a cultural history of theme parks called Theme Park, which studies this particular media form in all its various dimensions, including getting into the world of video games and simulations of theme parks and theme park and roller coaster simulators. And incidentally enough, the book was also translated into um, Arabic. And so um, it was kind of cool when that happened. So this is my, my work called Theme Park. So as much as you want to engage with media, this week, reach out to me as well and ask some questions in the discussion boards because I've done a ton of research in this particular area more than any of the other areas that we're talking about. So lastly, we can look at some additional media for this week. Scroll past the race media and get into specifics of media anthropology. Daniel Miller, as I mentioned here, very important work talking about selfies and Facebook, the anthropology of social media, lessons in digital anthropology, and then some of my own work, as well as the work of Faye Ginsburg, who's discussed in the book, studying indigenous film and um, different aspects of indigenous film in Australia. And I kind of finalize it then with some of my own lectures on research in consumer spaces, a particular talk I did with a number of designers at the annual amusement industry conference called IAPA in Orlando, Florida, and then a summary of my research on remaking and remixing. So you're welcome to engage with any of this media this week as you're considering some of these topics, but I think between race and media anthropology, you're going to have a lot to go on. I think it'll be a really exciting conversation that we'll have in our discussion boards. So reach out if you have any questions. As always, feel free to add your own discussion topic to our discussion board for the week. And I'll be back next week with the week nine lecture. Mm -hmm.